Um, okay, but yeah, welcome. Uh, good to see everyone. So last week, as you may remember or could guess on any random night, we didn't entirely finish the lesson. Now, I want to call it and say that we'll get through it all tonight, but it's just going to be dishonest at a certain point. So I'm going to try. We'll see what happens. Yeah, when someone says they're going to preach a short sermon, you know. <laughs> yeah. But we're, we're going to try. Yeah, yeah. It's the well-intentioned lies on a regular basis from the pulpit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, last week, what we did get to talk about, we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, that whole dramatic story. We talked about Peter being in jail and being released from jail and some more problems with the Sanhedrin. So tonight we're going to basically be talking about one person, which is why I think we can cover it. We're going to be talking about Stephen, who we haven't met as of yet in the text. And he has an important little arc that we're going to hopefully get through. There's going to be some stuff that goes on. There's going to be a sermon that we won't read all of. And yeah, hopefully we can get through it tonight. So why don't we open up in prayer and get started? Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for everyone who could make it out. Just pray that you'd be with us during this time. Uh, let us see something, something different, something unique in your word that maybe we haven't seen before, or if we're not familiar with it at all. Lord, let it be a uh, some sort of blessing and encouragement, and just let us see what you would have us see in your word. So I pray you'd be with us during this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so on your book, it should be page 43 if you haven't gotten there yet. And I think we'll just... Actually, I need someone's help, someone who's willing to read. I have the opening questions, but I don't have the opening paragraph that makes it make sense. Can someone read that out loud? Something about like children. Okay, is that all it says? Yeah, okay, good, good, thank you. Okay, so with that in mind, question one in your book, what do or did your children do when you would announce that you needed, some, uh, needed one of them to help you with a chore? Did they scatter, hoping not to get roped in to a chore? <laughs> some type of excuse. Sigh. They would sigh. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any anyone have like super helpful, dutiful, diligent children? <laughs> ah, bribery. The parenting trick of champions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, question two: What do you tend to do? when you have the opportunity to sacrifice your time to help someone out. You notice how they changed that a little bit? They put a spin on it, like, what do your awful kids do when you make them do chores? Now it's, what do you do when you have the opportunity to be sacrificial with your time and bless another human being, you, you know? <laughs> this is a lot more specific and harder. Oh, is what? Is there a massive typo in the book? Yeah. Oh, that's not what my book says at all. No, I read it word for word. What do you tend to do when you have the opportunity to sacrifice your time to help someone out? That's it. <laughs> so, the most physically demanding jobs on the planet, what do you do? Oh my goodness. 
So this book's just going to be all over the place tonight. No matter what happens, just roll with it. Ask questions later. But OK, so. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, does anyone have a, tend to have a less than saintly attitude when they're asked to help out with things? I know some people. Yeah. I could set that up. But I help people yep. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> You've heard of the walls of Jericho? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so, so we got the idea. So we're, in talking about Stephen, we're going to be talking about service in particular, uh, a heart of service, which would have contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira last week who did not have a proper heart of service, uh, but this will all blend together. So I'm actually going to ask you to turn back a couple pages in your book uh, to page 40, 40, page 40. Uh, this is how we're going to cover the opening with Stephen, but also, you know, stay on page 40 and turn with me to Acts chapter 6. All right, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. We're going to stop there. I know we're trying to get through a lot of material tonight. There was a lot in that, even though it's a short, par short sentence. In your book, on page, probably towards the bottom of page 40, it says uh, Luke's narrative shifts back to life within the early church. At first, this episode appears trivial when compared to the Ananias and Sapphira episode and the Sanhedrin incident. However, the very nature of the New Testament church lay at stake. The Grecian-speaking widows, or Hellenistic widows, were being ignored. The early church placed priority on the more conservative Jewish widows. We'll keep going. Two types of Jews made up the early church, Jews living inside Israel and Jews living outside of Israel. Many of those outside Israel spoke Greek and used the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. Many of these Greek-speaking Jews were less orthodox in their religious practice of Judaism. Hence, animosity existed between these two groups in Judaism, apparently in the early church as well. Okay, right off the bat, any questions about that? Because if we're not careful, when we're looking at verse 1 and we see like, oh, the, the Grecians against the Hebrews, we might be tempted to think we're dealing with a Jew and Gentile problem, like, like the Greeks and the Jewish people. But so far in the book of Acts, the gospel has not gone out to anyone but Jewish people. So... What they explain in the text is important. You have Jewish people outside of the Holy Land scattered in any country you can think of, especially the Greek-speaking world. They're a little less orthodox. They're a little less tied to Jerusalem and a lot of the practices. But both of these groups are coexisting in the church, and uh, there's some trouble. Because in verse 1, at the end of it, um, because their widows, the Grecian widows, were being neglected in the daily ministration. Do we have any idea what we're talking about with daily ministration? Yeah, so it's a... 
thought there was something about it in the book. Maybe not. Yeah, they, they, it seems like the church carried on a Jewish practice where especially like synagogue leaders or like el- com- elders in the community would provide some sort of need, like food, maybe some, some money or different things to widows in the community, typically on Fridays because they were getting ready for the Sabbath. And it seems like that's the practice that the church took up in order to help these, you know, they're, they're still all Jewish people anyway. They've just, they're following their Jewish Messiah. So they're keeping up with this Jewish practice, but there's some contention between the Grecian widows uh, say that they're not quite being cared for as they should. All right, so let's carry on with verse 2. Then the twelve, twelve apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, This is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests, Jewish priests, were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great miracles among the people. All right, handful of verses there. Oh, any, uh, any thoughts there? Anything jump out at you? They delegated. You'll find that in good business books, right? Delegation is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Did you notice how high, okay, so, so the job that's being done at this point is feeding and distributing goods to the widows that are among the community. Do you notice how high the standards were that they set for this? Like what they were requiring of the men who were being chosen to lead this? I think that's very interesting. Um, yeah, it's verse three. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom you may point over this business. I think that's very interesting that it's, you could easily be like, okay, we just, we need food given out, just throw bodies at the problem. And like, no, we, for service in the church, they wanted people who were wise, full of the Holy Ghost, clearly showing many Christ-like qualities because even something as simple that Peter kind of describes as like serving tables, he's comparing it to like being a waiter almost, it's like even to serve in this capacity, we're looking for something. We're looking for true servants here, which is interesting because I don't, I don't think we always think that way. Also, it kind of points to like what is the role of the apostles? Uh, me and Pastor, I've, I bring this up with him all the time, where I say like, okay, if there was this kind of problem in the church today, it was like, oh, you know, uh, we're doing a Christmas charity thing. Oh, there's no one to deliver the stuff. Odds are maybe pastor or his wife and, you know, maybe together, maybe like, maybe they'll go and and do it. Peter's like, I don't think he's being stuck up about it. I don't think he's being stingy with his time. He's saying "This, this is actually for other people in the church because we as the apostles have a very specific job which is interesting, it's worth thinking about. And also, finally, this issue between the Jewish, the Hebrew believers and the Grecian believers, 
is kind of emblematic of some of the troubles that the church is going to be dealing with for like a hundred years. When you look at the letters of Paul, he is constantly dealing with not just some of the more diaspora Jews as opposed to the regular the, the Jews in Jerusalem, dealing with differences between the Greek, the, the Gentile believers, the Jewish believers, and all sorts of conflicts that come into play here. So this is, a, this is the seed of a very big problem in the church. Okay, in your book on page 41, there should be a paragraph that starts with, interestingly, all seven men had Greek names. The one man, Nicholas, was not even a Jew. He was a convert to Judaism and then to Christianity. The Bible records nothing further about Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, or Nicholas. However, Luke would soon discuss the ministry of Stephen. Okay, we're going to see that. These men received their commission from the apostles through the laying on of hands. This practice visibly acknowledged the commissioning and granting of some type of authority. All right. Now we're going to head back. How are we doing on time? Not as great as I would like. Okay. We'll pick up speed here. I don't want to not let you guys talk because it's not as interesting when I just lecture at you all night. We should be okay getting through things. Uh, but let's pick up in Acts 6, and we'll start with 8 again. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned, uh, suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. There's a little more going on in that. Opening thoughts, what jumps out at you? Mm. No good deed, eh? Mm-hmm. And uh, all this conflict eventually will make the break. Okay. And, he, and I, I don't know, they, well, I guess when he preaches to them all, they, they, I don't know if the conflict was still in the, the synagogue thing and all that. You know, mm-hmm. But they probably were for a while, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Anything else jump out at you? Yeah, they always revert to the uh, to, to a low level of uh, credibility and you know, find some low level people. You know, mm-hmm. Bottom of the barrel people that have come up with something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Christ and a few other people in that they were yeah. very gay. So, so they, they do the same thing over and over again with this. Mm-hmm. All right, so it's interesting that Stephen is doing miracles and wonders. That's, that, we see that a lot in the book of Acts, but that's not a small incident. None of the other uh, seven are, that were just chosen are shown as doing anything of that sort. We don't ever hear from them again. Um, verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. Uh, why do you think that was? It's the Holy 
It is, yep. Holy Spirit. Mm. It almost reminds you of the one, the objection that Gamaliel had that we looked at last week, where he's like, hey, if this is of God, there's, we can't stand against it. Um, and then very quickly, well, they, they, they have nothing against any of his arguments. Um, yeah, so what do you end up doing when you have a problem where you're just like, man, I, I can't fight this at all? Are you like a really good person? And you go, well, obviously, I must be wrong. I'll just follow this. Logic has prevailed. It's a good day for everyone. Sometimes I think that we understand the Jewish reaction here a little better than uh, we like to admit. Sometimes you just try to kill the problem when, it's, uh, when you don't like it. Um, 11 through 14, we won't read them, but that's where you're getting what Pastor was saying, that they basically secretly go to certain people. They're trying to gather false witnesses. So one, as Pastor pointed out, this looks a lot like Jesus. And I've, I've been trying to point that out every time things like this happen, that the early church looks like Jesus. It's exactly what happened in his trial. Verse 14, uh, we've heard him... We've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, talking about the temple. That's exactly the main allegation that they were using in Jesus' trial. He said, I will tear this temple down and build it up in three days. And, of course, ironically, they are helping him do that as they are accusing him of blasphemy. And then, no, that's it. Yeah, same accusation used against Jesus. So, yeah, once again, you have the servants of the early church looking like Jesus. Verse 15, And all they that sat in the council, uh, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Surprised no one jumped on that. What on earth is that? Yeah. <laughs> what is going on there? I'm asking you. Yeah. So you think maybe when it says the face of an angel, like it doesn't really look like an angel, but I mean attitude, disposition, mm -hmm. countenance, mm -hmm. that sense of holiness, God's messenger, mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Or, you know, we've been going through Ezekiel. We saw some interesting yeah. cherubim stuff in uh, Sunday school. I don't think it's that, but, you know. <laughs> Possible. It's possible. <laughs> Moses' face glowed, you know? Yeah. That happened. Um, I do think question six is funny, a couple pages over in your book. It's probably at the bottom of page 45. What expression would be on your face if you were falsely accused before a court? <laughs> I don't know that anyone would describe our faces as that of an angel. When I'm not thrilled, my face looks pretty severe anyway, so, you know, I don't think that would be the case. No, I just found that funny. Um, so, yeah, top of page 46. Uh, we're, I'm jumping around a little bit. I wrote, not sure, but I like it. Uh, it says, Stephen's face was not normal. He showed... <laughs> He, he showed, yeah, right? Uh, he showed no anxiety, worry, or anger. Uh, instead, he looked calm, pleasant, and content. The members of the Sanhedrin were mesmerized by his face. They couldn't look away. The change in Stephen's appearance was a testimony to the Spirit's power inside him. It was also a testimony that his message was authentic. Stephen's face reminded the Sanhedrin of how Moses' face glowed every time he returned from the presence of the Lord. Sanhedrin mistakenly rested their power on the law of Moses. Stephen's connection with Moses was confusing to them. Stephen soon made the connection by way of a sermon. That's where I was like, I like it. it sounds good. It's reading an awful lot into the intentions there. Um, but who knows? It's there. It's what the book says. It was worth reading. It's interesting. Um, okay. Look at verse, oh yeah, verse nine. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and 
Cyrenians and Alexandrians and them of Cil uh, Cilicia uh, and of Asia disputing with Stephen. So the question is like, who on earth are we actually dealing with? Because yeah, they listed people, but for context, uh, who are we actually talking to? No, it's not great, no. Um, okay, for starters, real quick, what's a synagogue? Closer to a church than the temple. Yeah, it's where the Jews would typically gather on a regular basis, whereas the temple was only in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a lot of prayer, teaching, and debate was actually a pretty big feature in uh, the Jewish practices at the time. So that would have been a small, like, more like local thing like we think of as, as the local church. Who runs the synagogues? Looking for a type of, like a people group. Rabbis, what are they like? I'm sorry, I'm being, what? As a Jew. Yes, <laughs> the, the rabbis are Jewish. Uh, uh, Pharisees, as opposed to the Sadducees are more centralized in Jerusalem. Pharisees are like the rabbis of the people in Judea, so they are typically running the synagogues. Um, okay, so page, page 44 in your books. Again, jumping around. Uh, there's a paragraph that starts with scholars debate the exact identity of the synagogue of the Libertines uh, or freedmen, Acts 6-9. However, many believe that the synagogue was made up of former slaves of the Roman Empire or their children. During that time, over uh, 200 different synagogues existed. Each synagogue tended to attract people with similar backgrounds and ideologies. Many Jewish families who had experienced liberation from slavery gathered together with one another in the Freedmen Synagogue, the Libertines. The members from this synagogue came from North Africa, Cyrene and Alexandria, and Asia Minor, Cilicia and Asia. Uh, these former slaves were especially sensitive to any religious or political activity that might alert the Roman Empire. Although the Romans typically allowed self-rule in many towns and cities, any civil disturbances could lead to additional Roman troop deployments and harsh rule. As a result, the Jewish libertines viewed Stephen's ministry with great distrust. So that's interesting. That's like, you can look that up. The Synagogue of the Libertines is a historically known group of people. Um, and yeah, like the book said, there is some debate on exactly what's going on as far as membership to that specific synagogue. But yeah, that's, that's a well-known historical group in that area. OK. Any questions before we move on? OK. So all of chapter 7 is the Sermon of Stephen. We are not going to read all of chapter 7. He gives a long sermon as he's in this synagogue having to defend Basically, he's defending his good works and his miracles against these false charges, these false witnesses brought against him of blasphemy. So he's going to give a long sermon, and it's going to involve a lot of select history from Israel's past. He's talking to all Jewish people, rabbis and the like. So he's going to start way back with Abraham and kind of work his way through as he's working up to the events of the current day. And I want to point out that, no, I won't point this out yet. I look at, back up to chapter 6, verse 14. For we have heard him say, we've heard Stephen say, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, the temple, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Ver, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Then the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, okay, I'm setting that up so you know, like everything we've heard Peter or John preach, it's been, hey, Jesus is alive, the resurrection, believe he's died for Israel and their sins and it's going to the world. Stephen is answering a very specific question. They're charging him with these things that Jesus said, like, hey, this Jesus guy says he's gonna destroy the temple and do away with the customs of Moses. Is this so? And Stephen proceeds to give a very long answer. 
So that, that's where we are. This isn't a salvation sermon, and that's just what I want to point out at the beginning. And we can kind of talk about what it ends up being. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you looked like you had a, well, something to say. Oh. Is it a defense or is it a sermon? Hmm, good point. Hmm. I mean, yeah, you know what? I guess I always just thought of it as a sermon. Because, um, like... It's long enough to be a sermon. It's long enough to be someone's sermon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess you're right. It's actually not a sermon, is it? Because as I'm looking at my Bible here, it says Stephen's reply... It's just like a really well thought out, theological, historically dense reply. So, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yeah, don't give away the ending. <laughs> um, okay, Stephen Ser- uh, Stephen's reply. Jeez, I said it again. sermon again. Okay, we will look at Stephen's lengthy rebuttal. Okay, so we know what he's responding to. Let's open with 7, 1 to 8. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon, And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised, God promised, that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spoke on this wise, that this this seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring him into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. As long of a chunk as that is, that's actually a pretty good... uh, paraphrase of some of the chapters in Genesis. But I'll let you talk. Uh, Anything that jumped out at you from that short little history? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where everything started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After speaking about the history. Yeah. Yeah, he's winding up. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's up? Again, I'm all, yeah. He's also, <laughs> um, he's also showing them without saying, hey, look, I know the scripture is just like we do. Mm-hmm. Because they're so puffed up all the time about their knowledge. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, I'll let you know as we go forward, I will kind of just read stuff and point out some stuff and maybe not ask for our thoughts every time. But if something jumps out at you or you have a question, feel free to jump in. It just, it'll take forever if we stop after each section. Um, But yeah, that's good. So yeah, he starts with Abraham, which is who is the father of the Jewish nation. But he points out, and it's interesting, that Abraham is not a Jew. And that sounds strange. He's from the land of the Chaldeans. God calls him out into what will be the promised land. But he's not Jewish by birth. Like, the the Jewish people don't exist for a long time later. So he's kind of showing you this from the start. The father of the Jewish nation is not Jewish, um, he's called, and he brings up the circumcision, which a lot of us think, like, why on earth do we have to talk about that? As the teacher, I agree. However, it's a point that the Apostle Paul picks up on later, is that 
the circumcision, which was the sign to the Jewish people of the covenant promise with Abraham, Abraham was already called out of his homeland, called into the promised land. God already made a covenant with him, saying he would bless all nations through the seed of Abraham before the sign that is like embodies the Jewish people ever happened. So it's a really, it's really important groundwork that he's laying that I don't know how much it'll actually play into what he's saying going forward. Well, I, I do, I've, I've read this. But it's a really important concept of the gospel going beyond the Jewish people, that the Jewish Messiah is not just for the Jewish people, because the, Paul picks up this argument in several places, uh, Galatians, I think, specifically, where Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, was not Jewish, and the Jewish ritual starting at circumcision is the thing that wasn't even essential to Abraham. It was part of the later stuff that's being done away with. Okay, so he's starting out early in history, and then I'll move along quicker than this. Uh, but verse 9, and the patriarchs, the 12 sons of Jacob, the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. You'll notice that as he's doing this rundown of Israel's history, he always throws in shots of the rebellion, the rebelliousness of the Jewish people. So like he's making his certain theological points about Abraham and who he is, and then he's like, oh yeah, you know, he gave birth to these, the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel. And by the way, they were kind of awful and sold their brother into slavery in Egypt. And he just, he just puts that in there and keeps rolling on. But jump to verse 20. He jumps the story ahead, uh, verse 20. In which time Moses was born, after, after Israel was in Egypt for a time, Moses was born, which was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Yeah, we'll stop there. So once again, we're seeing a very important figure in Jewish history, Moses, who is, by the way, not in Israel, as the most important things in his story are happening. Or I guess he's never in Israel, is he? Yeah, no, he doesn't even get into the promised land. Like, he, he's never in Israel. He's in Egypt. So you have Moses, who's not in Israel. He's born and raised, basically, in Pharaoh's house. And he points out that Israel rejects Moses at the beginning, okay? If you remember this story in, in the Exodus, it's kind of just like a quick little thing. It makes Moses run away, like it's an important plot point in the life of Moses. Stephen's running through like a couple thousand years of history, and he, he makes sure to let you know, by the way, don't forget, Moses thought the children of Israel would see like, oh, God has called me to deliver the people, to bring them out of bondage, and they reject him. This is going to start becoming very relevant to the story of Jesus, okay? The one called to deliver them is rejected by the Jewish people. Okay, jump ahead, verse 36. Still talking about Moses. He brought them out, out of Egypt, after that he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren, like unto me, 
him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spoke to him in Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. All right, we'll, we'll halt there for a second. Now, what a, that was an odd way to say that. We're going to stop there for a second. Again with Moses, signs and wonders. It's interesting, Jesus accuses Israel that the Jews require a sign. They, they need to see the spectacles before they actually follow God. And Stephen's actually kind of pointing that out, like, hey, you rejected Moses the first time around. Now, after signs and wonders, you follow him out of Egypt. And he talks of the prophet to come in verse, 30, uh, yeah, verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is Moses speaking during the end of his life. He's telling Israel, There will come a day God will raise up a prophet like me who you, will, who you should follow. And this is... If you didn't fully understand when we were talking in the synoptic study last time, when I kept saying, like, there's a new Moses that's supposed to come, a greater Moses, it comes from the words of Moses himself that Stephen is quoting, that this new prophet, like Moses, that God will raise up for the children of Israel. And again, it ends in rebellion. Say, uh, it's an interesting turn of phrase how Stephen says that they turned uh, in their hearts they turned back again to Egypt. Because if you recall from the Exodus wanderings, they, they wanted to go back. No, no one actually left the Exodus group to go back to Egypt. But he says in their hearts, they, they turned back. Uh, they, they weren't happy with the leading of Moses, the leading of God and his laws, and wanted to go back into slavery. So it, it's rebellion again. And then... Um, Let's pick it up back in verse 40. They said unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Ref, uh, Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Did anyone catch like a thousand year gap that just happened in the text? I know I read it oddly, but... Can anyone explain what just happened there? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was asking people to explain. Yeah. Okay. Seeing if, like, at the very least, you know, we were just talking about Egypt, and then that section ended with, "You'll go into Babylon." And you go, "What just happened?" If you know about the Babylonian exile, it doesn't happen till. 500 something BC and we're like a thousand years before more or less in the wilderness with Egypt like three verses ago what happened so you have the wilderness wandering most people are at least familiar with the story where Moses goes up onto the mountain and is speaking with God he's up there 40 days receiving the law and stuff about the tabernacle and all this stuff and the people of Israel get restless down there and like, we don't know what happened to this guy. He was cool, I guess, but he's clearly gone. Who knows? We're never going to see him again. And they have Aaron make them a golden calf that is, seems to be supposed to represent the God of Israel, even though they've just agreed to not make idols. And they're doing that. They're worshiping that. They're sacrificing to that. And Moses comes back down the mountain in a fit of rage. 
Okay, so you have idol worship from the beginning, rebellion from the beginning as they're still at Mount Sinai. And then, of course, if you know why they went into captivity over a thousand years later, it was for hundreds and hundreds of years of rebelling against God, worshiping the gods of other nations, sacrificing to them, up and including child sacrifice to these false gods, to the point where God sends Babylon as his instrument of judgment on his people. So what Stephen interestingly did there with like with the history of Israel and with the text is he he kind of blends the idolatry at Sinai and he, he blends that in with the ultimate judgment on Jerusalem for idolatry that happens like a thousand years later. It's very interesting textually. He just he, he's making very interesting like historical allegorical connections to two similar events that take place thousand years apart on much different scales and it's it's clever it's clever i like it we at least on the same page there even if you don't think it's as clever as i do or interesting we we understand it okay okay oh yeah it is important to say i said why they went into babylon for hundreds of years of rebellion and idolatry what happened to Jerusalem when they were judged? Destroyed, leveled, Babylon rolled in, did not let up. For their sin of idolatry and rebellion, Jerusalem was demolished. That's important to keep in mind. And then uh, he does discuss... It's funny, he jumped a thousand years, but more for thematic purposes, because he does briefly discuss the conquest of Joshua, the conquests of David, and then look at verse 47, after David. But Solomon built him, God, a house. Howbeit, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. I'll ask some more specific questions in a second, but opening thoughts on what I just read. Technically, any of it, that's fine if you have any questions, but specifically what I just read there. Solomon to that ending. He is laying the death of Jesus at their feet. He has learned from Peter well, huh? Anything else jump out at you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when that happened, then, then he's back to uh, wider than Babylon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The root of the mm-hmm. of the first few prophets. And so that has to deal with them. And then he says the uh, people he's talking to are the same as. Yeah. The uh, former family members. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, those are basically my thoughts. So, uh, the temple, 
even Solomon's temple, which, like you said, the pinnacle of Jewish history, is not truly the dwelling place of God. Like, his presence is there in the extent that it is, but even Solomon says, like, God's throne is in heaven, earth is his footstool, what, what palace can you build for me, basically? So that's important, because again, remember the question that Stephen is answering. Did you say that this Jesus guy is going to destroy the temple and do away with the, the traditions of Moses? So he, he's going back to Solomon, and if you're not paying attention, the hard left turn that occurs at verse 51 can really catch you off guard because he's been doing all this historical stuff and then 51 you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you do always resist the holy ghost as your fathers did so he he goes from long-winded history into harsh allegation on the turn of a dime and so, and inter interestingly, when he's calling them uncircumcised in heart, we talked about Abraham's circumcision at the beginning. That's the sign that you are the covenant people of God. And he's saying, like, yeah, you're, you're Jewish. Inwardly, you have no part of this. You are nothing to do with the actual promises and movements of God throughout history. He's, he's, he's tough. He is not pulling his punches here. Um, so... Yeah, that's the line of his logic, like Pastor pointed out. He's, it's just been the history of Israel and their rebellion over and over and over again. Even so much as the rebellion at, with Babylon that results in, yes, that temple that they love so much being destroyed. And it's basically they are rebellious to what God is doing and will be judged. We, we looked at this countless times in our synoptic study you really can't get away from the preaching of Jesus without seeing coming judgment on Jerusalem, just like in the days when Babylon came and destroyed the temple. And I can't see how Stephen's doing anything but just absolute judgment and condemnation here, which is why I was pointing out right at the beginning, what question is he answering? And this is not a salvation sermon. At no point is he saying, look, this guy died for your sins. He's the Lamb of God. He's this, he's that. Follow him. This is a straight judgment. This is rough. This is harsh. There's nothing fun about the sermon that he's doing here, or the response that he's doing here. Um, uh, I wrote for, we weren't in the book for any of that because there are some good insights but I think, once again, kind of like with that other comment about Stephen's face, the book overstates Stephen's case here, and it doesn't go for the jugular. It doesn't tell you straight up, like, he's, I would say he's borderline, repeat, he, he's not borderline, he's repeating the message that Jesus had, the claim that Jesus made countless times, that the new Babylon was coming to destroy rebellious Jerusalem. I, I think that's what's happening here. That's what seems to be the, the thrust of the text. We have to finish at least this chapter, and I will, ask, I will open for questions. As you can imagine, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, and they stoned Stephen, who, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down with a loud voice and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I will point out quickly so that you guys can have a, a bit of time here. Verse 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Again, we're echoing Jesus, Luke 23, 46. He said, Lord, into, my hand, into thy hands receive my spirit. 
uh, verse 60, when he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, lay, uh, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. It echoes Luke 23, 34, which is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Once again, you have Stephen looking a whole lot like Jesus as he's being falsely accused on almost the exact same charges as Jesus, condemned, put to death. He mentions the Son of Man in page 56. We did a whole lot of Son of Man stuff in the last study. And the ending in verse, verse 60, that, that whole thing, he kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Obviously, this is a euphemism. He, he died. He died. But Luke almost portrays the first death in the early church as like almost in a beautiful, peaceful sort of way. He's being stoned to death. There's nothing pretty about this. But his final thing that he's doing on this earth is kneeling down, asking for the forgiveness for the people, and Luke uses this euphemism of he, he fell asleep. And this is a euphemism that continues into the New Testament times. So it's, it's tragic, it's dark, it's horrible, and Luke is painting it in a certain way so that you see it for what it is, in the way that we're, like, we're supposed to see the sacrifice of Jesus all throughout this, that the trial, everything that's said. So even as you see the first, the death of the first martyr in the church, he's pointing you back to the actual like first martyr the whole time, the death of Jesus, which resulted in resurrection and life. And he's sort of painting Stephen in that same light. So you, not only so you know what happened, but so you understand what he's saying is happening. Okay, so it is 758. No pressure, no rush, but I talked a lot because there was a lot to get through. Thoughts, questions, I see, I feel like a couple people have questions. Anything. Why do you suppose that uh, he wrote fell asleep? Is it anything like <clears throat> just putting a softer spin on it? Mm. Like the way we say, when somebody asks us about somebody who's... Yeah, they, 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 they passed away, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be one of two things. So when we say someone passed away, uh, passed on, it's, that's a euphemism. That's a nicer way to say something harsh. It could be that. It, it's very likely that. Let, let me put it that way. There's something that I like better because I heard someone say it and I think it's phenomenal. They talked about the idea, because Paul uses this language, too, of, you know, the Christians who sleep in Christ, the, the ones who have died, martyred, anything like that. I heard a pastor say once that, you know, Christians have hope of the resurrection. So a Christian dies on earth, they're with the Lord, and they will one day be resurrected. And he said that, Falling asleep is a much more accurate descriptor than died. In, he said, I always remember the phrase, he said, when we talk about Christians in death, death is the euphemism. And I was like, I don't know if that's what Luke or Paul has in mind, but I thought that was such a beautiful concept because we say like, oh, when something dies, it, you know, it's not alive, it's not coming back, it's dead. And saying like, oh no, he fell asleep is actually a more accurate phrase. I'm sure someone could look up an ancient, New ancient Greek New Testament turns of phrase and see that maybe this, everyone uses this, maybe, I don't know. But that's a cool theological point that I had to share with you, so I don't know. Any other questions or thoughts? Go ahead. Yeah. Same way with this. I mean, he gave the message whether they liked it or not. 
Mm -hmm. Mm. I mean, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. But to me, it paints it as a victorious yeah. incident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like Did it. Did they actually bite him? That's a good question. What was the gnashing of teeth? It said they gnashed on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, obviously, they actually did. It sounds weird. Yeah. They, they actually showed full of hatred and bitterness and anger. But they, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. You, you, you can take it a few different ways. Uh, the Greek is not incredibly clear, and it, it may be something that is also a turn of phrase, um, because you have gnashing of teeth in a handful of scenarios where it doesn't always seem that way. Uh, some people kind of, like some just people will translate it as something like, um, like they, like baring their teeth, like, like a extreme animalistic anger type thing. Um, but that's always, always in use of the word um, as opposed to law. Right. Again, it's the the Greek is tricky. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't be upset with anyone who holds either view. It's not a big thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Greek is tricky. They could have been biting them. They could have been uh, kind of like baring their teeth type thing. Uh, could be more of anger. It, it's hard to say. Anything else? Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's just that they were, they, they disagreed with <laughs> Yes. Yes, they did. Yes. Yeah, the same. And, Go ahead. And they're probably, because these guys are still in, in, in the temple thing, in the Jewish thing, in the synagogue thing, and they're the Christians. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. It, they're not incredibly clear on it, but probably under a year, maybe six months. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is early. Yeah. Um, yeah, so pastor's definitely right. They, that's the thing. They, they didn't stone him because they were confused. Like, they knew exactly what he was saying. It's very similar, again, to one of the par a few of the parables of Jesus, where like half the time we're sitting there going like, what, what was he saying? But he speaks a parable and the Pharisees are like, it, one of the authors will comment, the Pharisees knew that he spoke of them and sought reason to kill him. And like, yeah, they, especially when he talks about coming judgment um, from the new Babylon, which ends up being Rome, who will eventually just decimate Jerusalem for similar reasons, not idolatry, but rebellion. And yeah, Stephen's message goes over exactly the same. They fully understand what he's saying, and that's why they put him to death. So we see a couple things. We do see the heart of service, and I know it seems like talking about the widows, and most people consider the, found, like the voting in of those seven men to be the founding of the office of deacon or elder in the church, the, the servants to the leader. We see the heart of service that even just feeding the widows, the servants of Christ were supposed to be men of wisdom, full of the Holy Ghost, willing to serve the people. And from, uh, from Stephen, we see just condemnation. And it is rough and brutal, but it is apparently what the Holy Spirit had him speak in that moment. And it cost him his life, but it was the truth. It was what needed to be said and it would continue to 
help the church, as counterintuitive as that seems, uh, the, the death of the martyr, just like Christ's death was not the end, the death of Stephen is not the end, and it's not anywhere close to the end for the church. So those are the big things we get from the life of Stephen. So I think that's pretty good. We've gone on just long enough, a little longer than I should have. Apologies. But we can close in a word of prayer. Holy Father, thank you for uh, this study. Thank you for your word thousands of years after it was written. I thank you that we can understand it, that we can still uh, glean quite a good deal from it and uh, learn a little bit more about who you are and uh, who your servants were and who uh, some sort of image of who you would have us be. So I thank you for your word. I pray that we would take something special from it. Pray that you'd bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.